Hi, Peter. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, Alex. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just clicking a few buttons here. I'm going to go live on Facebook, I hope. And uh, if the tech gods are willing. A big if. <laughs> Always, but it's what, it's what makes life so exciting. All right, apparently we're good. Things are dinging all over the place. Is that Excellent. your computer? My computer dinging. No, that's me. That's me dinging. Hang on. All right. Enough dinging. All right. Well, we're going to get going. Um, I think I've done everything I was supposed to do this time, which makes a pleasant <laughs> change. All right. Off we go. So, hello and welcome everybody to the fifth installment of Must Read TV, the Skylark bookshop virtual author series. My name is Alex George and I'm the owner of Skylark, which is an independent bookstore in downtown Columbia, Missouri. I'd like to encourage all of you to go to our website, which is skylarkbookshop.com and look at the events page um, and uh, look at all of the events that we still have to come. Uh, and I would encourage you to uh, consider making Must Read TV part of your week, uh, part of your online uh, literary activities. Uh, we have some wonderful authors coming in the next few weeks, including Natalie Jenner, Christina Baker Klein, um, and Caroline Levitt. And in fact, just today we've added two more for October. So we're continuing to do this and uh, hopefully uh, you are all enjoying it. Um, I first met, I've been looking forward to this evening, I should say, for a very long time. Uh, I first met this evening's guest, Peter Guy, at a booksellers convention in Minneapolis. And I think it was nine years ago, but I might be wrong about that. We were both there as authors, uh, signing copies of, um, of books. Um, and I already knew about Peter because his publisher at that time was Unbridled Books, whose editor, Greg Michelson, lives right here in uh, Columbia. And, and back in the olden days, um, uh, Greg and I used to have lunch at Teller's every so often. And uh, every time we had lunch, he would push a pile of books across the table at me in much the same way that a, a rapacious drug dealer would uh, dangle his wares in front of an addict and uh, helpless I, I took them all uh, and that is how I discovered Peter's first book uh, Safe from the Sea which I completely fell in love with so I was very keen to meet him um, when we were in Minneapolis, although I was also rather intimidated by the prospect because I loved his book so very much. After our signing session was over, we uh, repaired to the hotel bar uh, and had a beer. Uh, and, and just parenthetically, one of the things I've never forgotten, and I don't know whether you still do this, Peter, but when you signed my copy of your book, you drew a picture in it, uh, of a really quite nice picture of a boat, and I've, I've never, never forgotten it. Um, anyway, uh, um, so I managed to get totally, totally sidetracked by my own stories. But um, anyway, Peter was completely lovely and brilliant and kind. Uh, and I'm happy to say that since then we have shared many more beers and many more hotel bars. Uh, probably too many, but oh well. Uh, so since then I've followed Peter's career with, with huge interest, waiting impatiently for each new book. Uh, after Safe from the Sea, uh, there was a stunning trilogy of novels. Uh, the Lighthouse Road, Wintering, and now, finally, the last book in the trilogy, Northernmost. Northernmost has been praised to the heavens by an extraordinary collection of, of authors, including Nathan Hill, Maggie Shipstead, and Tom Franklin, but I'm actually going to read the words uh, written about it by another independent bookseller who is also a mutual friend of ours. Her name is Kristen Sandstrom, and here's what she wrote about the book. Shakespeare wrote, what's past is prologue. Through Guy's lyrical prose, we are reminded of the importance of where we came from and what we leave for those after us. Northernmost illustrates the power of true adventure, adventure through risking life and limb in the Arctic, adventure through loss, adventure through love, and adventure through the most powerful self-discovery. This book will leave an imprint on your heart. To which I can only say, She's absolutely right. Uh, Northernmost was due to be published this April and we had already lined up uh, an in-house appearance for Peter. I think it was gonna be in June, only for all of those plans, of course, to be scuppered by COVID-19. Publication of Northernmost was delayed until a couple of weeks ago. 
Uh, and while I would much rather, of course, have preferred to see Peter in person, this is the next best thing. If you enjoyed this evening's conversation, please, please, please help us out and purchase a copy of Peter's book from Skylark. Each novel comes with a signed book plate, and if you are one of the first 25 people to buy a copy of the book, it also comes with a Skyku, which is a haiku written by Peter, especially for us, on a signed and numbered bookmark that he has, uh, he is, uh, everyone is, is numbered and dated and signed as well. Collectors items, every one of them. So to reserve your copy, just send us an email to uh, mail at skylarkbookshop.com. It's on a first come first serve basis. We'll give you a call tomorrow, take pair of payment and, uh, and ship it off to you. If you've got a question for Peter, please write it in the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom screen, or if you're watching on Facebook Live, please type it in the comments. Uh, I'm flying solo tonight because I'm actually going to be asking the questions as well as monitoring all that, so I will beg your uh, indulgence if I, get, <laughs> if I get a little lost or I, I don't get to all of the questions, so I'm going to apologise in advance for, for all of that. All right. Hi, Peter. How are you? I'm doing well, Alex. How about you? I'm good. So first of all, after all that, I also have some huge congratulations, I think are in order, because I saw that you went into the Midwest Indie Bookseller bestseller list at number three. I saw that myself. It's very exciting. And it, it, it speaks to something, I must say. Uh, and I would have I would have brought this up anyway, thanks not only to um, its truth, but also to your lovely and kind words of introduction that uh, the only thing that seems to make any sense anymore to me in this world is that people are still buying books. And more than ever, from what I understand, at least in many cases, they're going to the stores in their communities to do that, which for someone like me, who has been beating this drum for a long time, that is that we ought to support independent booksellers, uh, that is uh, music to my ears, both that um, people are taking northernmost under their wing here in the in the heartland, um, but also that people are doing that generally, that is supporting local businesses. Um, I say all the time and mean sincerely that I think of independent booksellers as sort of the, the arbiters of taste. Um, you know, the big box stores and Amazon, they just buy what is most readily available um, and uh, without independent bookstores, writers like me just don't have much of a chance to make a living. And so I'm super grateful for that. And I must say uh, also, Alex, um, you know, it is heartbreaking that I'm not there in Columbia to see you and to enjoy another one of those beers in another one of those bars. Uh, and I look forward to that someday soon. Um, but your friendship and your support and your words of encouragement, your kind words of encouragement, I mean, tonight, of course, but always such a boon for me. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm so grateful and so happy to see you, even if it is just on the box of wires here. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you. All right. So you're going to talk a little bit about the book and then read, yeah. uh, read an extract for us? Yeah, Wonderful. I'll do that. Um, and, and I'll say at the outset that I'm really looking forward to the conversation with you, of course, but also to the folks in the audience. And I don't I can't really see anything. I have a, a, so it looks like there's a few people here anyway. A, a quite a, Oh, that's, that's a nice number of folks in the audience tonight. Please be a part of this conversation. Uh, I, I um, you know, as a writer, I spend all my time in my office alone and, 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 and laboring and struggling and doubting myself and to get out into the world such as it is uh, and to have a conversation with the reader. That's sort of the, that's the payoff for me. And so I hope you'll join the conversation uh, a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, I thought I would just, you know, uh, I'm sure that the conversation that Alex and I will have will be most illuminating. Uh, but before we have that conversation, just a few words about the book and a short reading. Um, and what can I say? I mean, Alex, Alex mentioned it. This is the third book in a series of books, uh, a, a trilogy or a uh, three companion novels, as it's been suggested, or a family saga over three novels, however it wants to be described. It's not up to me. Um, but this is the, the third and final of them. And it is such a sweet and bittersweet thing to be at this point, to be effectively done with the family, at least for now. Um, and I've been, you know, uh, 
how, how to describe it, almost putting off writing this book because I wanted the, the, the satisfaction of being with this family to linger longer. Uh, but finally it is written and finally it is published uh, after many, many delays and I'm, and I'm super excited about it. Uh, so Northernmost, and I have a picture over here, I think it's just such a beautiful cover and the book itself is put together so beautifully, um, tells two stories. So this, this, the, the family in this book, I've covered um, seven generations of them. Uh, and, and, and this story, Northernmost, includes the first generation of that, a family in, um, in Arctic Norway in the 1890s, and the last storyline, a contemporary storyline in 217. So it sort of bookends the other two books, uh, The Lighthouse Road and Wintering, and, um, and, and, and hopefully sort of through the, through the memory of those two books, both of these characters are. One is looking forward, of course, to his family's future, and the contemporary woman is looking back through her family's history. And so a little bit about each of the storylines. In the first one, in the earlier timeline, there's a, a man named Odin Ride who lives in the far north of Norway in a town called Hammerfest. And because of their poverty and because of their um, lack of, of opportunity, he sends his daughter to America. After he does so, life does not get better or easier for him. And he hasn't heard from his daughter in a very long time since she left. And so um, looking for opportunity, he takes a job aboard um, a boat that's going to be uh, taking sportsmen to and from uh, Spitsbergen, which is an Arctic island halfway between the northernmost point of Norway and the North Pole, a, a true life place. And what would have been a true life job? This is, there's a, a fair amount of real life history mixed into it. While he's there, he gets another job working on a sealer, as a seal hunter. And as a consequence of that, uh, he and his partner who are hunting one day, um, his partner is killed, mauled by a polar bear. He's um, thought to be dead as well. And um, back in his hometown village, his wife is having a funeral for him when he returns. And I'll get to that in just a second because I'm gonna read a few minutes of that story. Uh, but his story is one of um, patching his life back together, patching his marriage back together and telling the story of what happened up on that uh, Arctic island. And I ho hopefully it's a little bit of adventure. Um, it's, I, 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 I'm a softy for this, but I think the love story between um, Odiner, that man, and his wife Inger is, uh, is super touching and super sweet. Um, but it's offset by the contemporary story in which a, a woman named Greta, who is his uh, three times great granddaughter, three or four times, I don't even remember, great granddaughter, uh, lives in Minnesota, um, is, uh, is married and has a couple of children. Sadly though, she's, she's in a quite unhappy marriage. And her husband, who's a Norwegian himself and a descendant of the great polar explorer, Fritjof Nansen, um, has gone off to Norway uh, for, for business and she's gonna follow him. Um, this is on the heels of a, of a pretty terrific fight that they have, one of many. And instead of going to track him down and to confront him and to, to talk to him about their life, she diverts herself and ends up in this small town, the town of her ancestors. And so she spends, uh, she spends a week there by herself, um, kind of adrift, but also, as it turns out, falling uh, head over heels for a, for a man that she meets. And it's through that relationship that she gets wind of, of Odiner's story. And, uh, and, and, and begins to think about the consequences of her actions and the consequences of her family's life. So these two stories just go back and forth and they're hopefully braided in a way that, that, gives, uh, that gives a little extra meaning to them um, and amplifies the, all of the emotions in, in, in both of their lives, the happiness and the sadness and, uh, and, and the joy and the sorrow. And I thought what I'd do to get us started is just read a, a, a couple of pages. It's literally about two and a half pages. And it's the end of the first chapter and the very beginning of the second chapter. So the first chapter, you'll get a, a taste of Odiner's voice. And in the second chapter, you'll get a, a little flavor uh, uh, for Greta's voice in this story. And all you need to know is that Odiner has returned and made his way through town. Uh, nobody can believe it. And the reason they can't believe it is because 
um, his wife is at this very moment at the cemetery uh, celebrating his death or commemorating his death. And she speaks first, her name is Inger. My God, can that be you, she said. Inger, did I say your name aloud? Did I say, is that you? I noticed Banked and the pastor stepped back together as though startled. Inger's eyes widened as the horse's head and she looked down at her Bible and closed it and then looked at me from, the bot from bottom to top. I took my hat from my head and held it before me as if I was some gentleman. I could see her trembling hands and heaving chest and when stepping closer, her wet eyes now glaring at the gravestone at her feet. Inger, is that our daughter? Is that Thea? She looked up and blinked the wetness away. Thea, she said, and shook her head no. She said Thea again and finally came to me. She put a hand on my shoulder and then on my face and said, her fingers still in my ratty beard, but you're dead, Odiner. Dead? That's what they said on Spitzbergen. You and that man, Berger Mickelson, at Crossfjorden, killed by an ice bear. She kept her hand on my face as though she could not otherwise believe I was there. That's what they said. Berger died on Crossfjorden, but I didn't. I'm home in here. When she dropped her hand, I could see the softness of the inside of her wrists and the pink of her cold flesh. What trailed her hand was a fresh scent, nearly floral, something I'd never smelled before. Bank coughed and Inger looked over her shoulder, stuffed her hand into her pocket, and in the same motion, stepped back beside the gravestone. The pastor came forward, and now he rested his hand on my shoulder and raised his hand to the still shrouded skies. The waters saw thee, O oh God, the waters saw thee. They were afraid, the depths were also troubled. At this, he looked at me. I was but a man, he said softly, before walking over to the carriage and climbing onto the seat. Now I looked at Bengt, his thumbs hooked in his frock coat as he looked down his veiny nose. The grin of a fatted man spread across his face. He stepped to the gravestone and took Inger by the elbow, kicking at the ground with his leather boot. Don't carve in stone what could be branded on birch board. I guess that's the moral of this story. He bent his thick neck and whispered something in Inger's ear before turning back to me. But don't you worry, Odiner. I'll add the cost of this stone to what's already owed. Then he too walked to the carriage where he handed Inger her purse and took a seat next to the pastor. The horse nickered and turned down the cemetery path. Inger watched them go, the fog going with them. And I looked down at the gravestone. Ode Einer Eid, it read, born 1854, died on the ice in the year of our Lord, 1897. She turned to me, my wife did, and the look on her face left me to wish I had been lost on the ice in this treacherous year of life. Now the story moves to 2017. She might have been watching herself asleep at home, the soft rise and fall of her belly in the arch of her hip under the gray duvet made violet by winter's darkness, but she wasn't watching herself and she certainly wasn't sleeping. She hadn't slept properly since she couldn't remember when. And so she wasn't dreaming herself into a hummock of snow. She knew the mounds and curves were buried gravestones taking light from the quivering aurora. She followed that light skyward up above the hillside as it melted into the blues and greens and then an almost glaring orange the color of a Lake Superior sunrise. She could as easily have been standing back on the shoreline in Gunflint now, her evening behind her, but in fact she had never been so far from home. And all that stood behind her was the dark church and beyond that, sorrow sound in the islands distant across the water. I'll end there. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. <clears throat> that really gives a wonderful flavor of the, the, uh, the, the, the tone of both of those stories, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I, felt, I wanted to ask you, first of all, about that wonderful opening scene, which I was terribly jealous of uh, when I read it. Um, uh, when he, yeah, he essentially sort of interrupts his own funeral. Um, and I was just curious, um, 
did you always know that that was how you were going to begin that book? I know that certain writers, I mean, John Irving is famous for always writing the last line first, and yeah. certain people know how they're going to begin books. I never do. Did you, did you always know that was how you were going to begin this? No, no. In fact, um, that, well, I shouldn't say no, like definitively. I did not know where the book would begin. I will say, and what's especially peculiar about that scene to me, is that um, I wrote that scene, or a version of that scene, the version, uh, a, a, a scene where Thea's father, a man who I did not know very well yet, Thea is the, their daughter, the woman who comes to America, and is the, the first family member that we meet of this clan. Um, and I wrote her first in 2009. The second thing I wrote was this man arriving home from somewhere, coming to a graveyard and finding his funeral in effect. So that scene or a version of that scene was written 10 years ago or 11 years ago. And it of course changed dramatically over the years, but that's been part of the project of writing these three books is that I didn't know at first in the first say six months of, of writing The Lighthouse Road, what was going, you know, what was even happening. Um, and that was a consequence of that. Once, once I, you know, once I wrote The Lighthouse Road and once I wrote Wintering and it was time to really um, settle down and begin this book, I wrote those scenes, the first probably three or four chapters of Odiner's character alone and, and had a very good sense of who that man was um, and knew that I wanted to begin probably in that scene. That was the scene that made the most sense to me. So um, that's a comp complicated answer to a pretty simple question. Um, but I guess for me, it's not so simple after all. It, well, I mean, these things never are, but I love the fact that you actually wrote it sort of 11 years ago and just... Um, and it's just been hanging out there waiting for waiting yeah. for its time. That's 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 kind of wonderful. So you talked about um, Odina's journey, his fateful journey up to the Arctic. Um, and over the course of the book, we relive that that uh, incredible adventure, which is both horrendous and completely gripping at the same time. One of the things that you wrote is a line that I loved is that a man doesn't end up on this northern edge of the world without having looked first into the very depth of his soul, which I just thought was a wonderful line. Um, and one of the things that you do so wonderfully in all of your books, um, and we mentioned this when we spoke a few weeks ago on that, that Zoom thing that we did, uh, and I, this was, so just, just by way of background, a bunch of booksellers got together to talk about this book and we all had to say one thing and I immediately said, well, I know what I want to talk about. <laughs> and it's this, and it's the sense of place um, that you always manage to evoke in extraordinarily vivid terms. Um, uh, and it's all the more impressive because, you know, if I were to guess, most people reading this book have not been to um, the places where Odina goes and the, the sort of the Arctic tundra. And, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how important place is for you when you write your fiction and yeah. how do you go about bringing the reader to these, these, these extraordinary places. Well, I, I appreciate so much that observation and it, it's, not, um, it's not something that I would shy away from ever. I've made a, a very much a, a, a priority, these landscapes and these, and, 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 and in some cases cityscapes, I guess, as well. Uh, but they seem so important to me. Uh, and they do for a couple of reasons. One of them is that I have a ton of fun writing them. Uh, I love to use that sort of, I think of myself while writing those scenes as a sort of movie director, where I get to like choose the, the cinematic effect. And that's one of the things that I'm doing there. But I also think that in, in these books, uh, especially, that the places the characters inhabit, and whether it's Spitsbergen or Hammerfest, or the North Shore, or even the scenes that take place in Minneapolis in this book, uh, they're, they're instrumental to my way of thinking uh, uh, in, in terms of how they inform character. And, and if you're um, a man like Odiner who lives in this village, in the, in the, in the farthest place you can get in Norway, uh, that makes you a certain kind of person. You're, you're, um, you're inevitably a different kind of person than you are if you live in Christiana, what we now know as Oslo, right? Those are just two different, might as well be, 
you know, uh, different continents in, in so many ways. And that's important to me. I want the people to be of the place that they're from. I want them, and I want the place to come to life. Um, and I had a really interesting experience. Most of my storytelling, most of the books have taken place on the North Shore of Lake Superior. And plenty of northernmost does as well. About half of it takes place there, a little less than half of it. And that place is so important to me for so many reasons. I've talked about it often. It's, it's, um, it's uh, sufficient to say that it's my favorite place in the world and I go there all the time and, uh, and feel like it's my home away from home. Like I, I know all the mile markers and w which restaurants you come to and which rivers you cross and, and where the best vistas of the lake are and all those things. Um, but I've been there, I don't, I don't even know, hundreds of times, hundreds of days I've spent on the North Shore. And for the longest time, for years, I mean, for like eight or nine years, I had never been to Hammerfest or to Spitsbergen. And though I had done my research and, you know, uh, and, and looked at pictures and done, walked with Google Maps through the village of Hammerfest now, uh, I, of course, had no way of, of being there. I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say I had no way. I hadn't gone there yet. Uh, and, and so I'd spent all this time imagining it and, you know, and bringing it to life in my mind and then had the experience of going to visit this place. And I must say uh, that as soon as I arrived in Hammerfest, I was like, yes, this is, this is where my people are from. You know, I had that, it was very much a, a, a sort of homecoming kind of feeling for me. And, and most of what I had imagined and what I had described seemed totally plausible. And, and with respect to the weather, with respect to the, to the landscape and the streams and the, and the lake that's right behind the village of Hammerfest and the islands out in the sound, all of that seemed real. And so I thought, good, like you've done a good job of imagining this, Peter. Spitsbergen was another matter though. I hadn't spent nearly as much time there in my imagination as I had Hammerfest. And so, and I visited there as well uh, and needed the experience of being there and breathing that air and seeing that vastness and experiencing what it was like to be on one of the few places on earth where there is never been a native population. It's a, it, it's this th place still where there are more polar bears than people and no, no one is from there. And that uh, was not it's something I knew, I guess, but to understand that and to stand there and to understand why no one is from there and, uh, and what that felt like and what that meant, that really, I think, informed Odiner's experience that he has there at least from my perspective, what I wanted to give him there. No one's from there. Oh, I love that. That's, that's fascinating. Um, that's very cool. So you, you mentioned that we have, we have these two stories going on in parallel. We have Odiner and then we have Greta, thoroughly modern uh, story said in 2017. And one of the things that struck me, and I think it was actually Kristen, who I mentioned before, who talked about this when we had that chat, was, was the language, and that, uh, which you use, and nobody could be in any doubt when you're reading this book, if you opened it at a page in, at random, um, which story you're in, because you operate so s seamlessly within the, these two entirely different linguistic registers. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about how you how you did that because you're you're effectively it's it's one book and it's seamlessly blended together but you are talking you it's as if you're using two different languages almost yeah. and i was just curious as to how hard that was and then i have a sort of a crafty type question which is and you kind of alluded to this a little bit but i'd like you to expand a little bit more did you um did you because the the the, the chapters is told in sort of um, one after the other, but did you write them like that or did you write a long bit of one character and then go the other way and write write the other one and then shuffle yeah. them together at the end? So to that second question first, I mentioned just a few minutes ago that part of the experience of writing this book was knowing, uh, I don't think I said this, but this is true, um, I knew Ode Einer's story, much more of it at the outset than I did Greta's story. 
Greta was late to the party, as they say. She was, in fact, the last character that I imagined in this family. She and her, she and her daughter lived with a sort of the last, what I saw as the, I mean, I knew that they were going to be foundational characters, but I didn't know anything about them. When I, when I, 10 years ago, when I sort of sketched out what three books might look like. Um, so I knew much more about Ode Einer, and part of the reason that that's true is because I felt like I needed to in order to understand Thea in the Lighthouse Road better. So like I said, there were a, a handful of these chapters, I don't remember, there were probably four or five of them uh, before I knew anything about Greta. Once I sort of got those chapters in tune or aligned with the, the family story that had come before it, I immediately started to layer Greta in. And the reason that I did that was for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted those lives to come together simultaneously and to develop simultaneously because it's important for me that because I'm telling two stories in dramatically different time and in different linguistic registers, as you say, a, a, a phrase that I like very much, I needed their amplification to be simultaneous. Otherwise, it would, be, it would have felt too much to me in the writing, never mind to any eventual reader in the reading, that these were different stories and different lives, and why would they be together? Um, and what I discovered, so what I discovered was that, um, well, a couple of things. There were all sorts of ways and I, don't, I didn't necessarily search these things out, they just appear before me, I guess. All sorts of ways and all sorts of images and mechanisms of storytelling and their fates that seemed intertwined. And I was able to use those to help um, bridge the, the, the gap and the distance between those linguistic registers. So, so that was really important to me, to, to, to bring them to life together so that those things could announce themselves to me and that I could take advantage of them accordingly. With respect to, you know, to finding Odiner's voice, I've said this many, many times in my life and answer to questions from, from fellow writers or, or, or readers or whomever, and that is that the further I am removed from a, a character or a storyline by time, by distance, by gender, by uh, geography, anything else uh, that's significant in life, um, the happier I am in the writing of it, and the more alive I feel as a writer in the writing of it. And so, and part of that is just my imagination. Like that's what I think my job is. That's why I'm able to do this because I have an imagination. And what that means is that I have to apply that imagination to the voice that's gonna tell his story. And that sounds like, oh, like I just decide to do it. And partly that's true. And partly that's a result of reading a lot of books by uh, Knut Hamsen and Charles Dickens and, and uh, other writers, you know, from the, from the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. But also that's a consequence of knowing Norwegian people my whole life. And I say, I, I've said a couple of times flippantly, like you don't have to go to Norway to, to see this. If you live in Minnesota, you can go to the Scandinavian market called Ingebrigtsen's the weekend before Christmas, and you can see the men still behaving the way Ode Einer behaves to this day, and still mumbling and grunting and hardly talking to their wives. And so that's, that's around here, that's in the air in Minnesota. Um, and then, and then the other thing that I'd say about it, and, and this is more true of this story than any of the others, and that is that because so much of it takes place in Norway, and what would have been a language different than my own, one that I don't speak, uh, and because so much of it takes place in the Arctic, it, you know, an experience that I could hardly even begin to imagine, despite the, the, the dozens of books that I've read about polar explorers, I needed the language for that. I needed, I, I needed words that weren't just snow and ice, that weren't just fog and distance. And so one of the, one of the projects was to sort of develop a, a, a glossary for this book. And that was largely the result, it's not here anymore, but for a while I had Nance, Fritjof Nansen's Farthest North here. And that's a book that if you look at the marginalia, there's, you know, 
every third page there's this word circle with a question mark next to it, like, what does this mean? That then I would go and find out what it meant. And I think that that, that sort of, that glossary and those words help orient it, help give it that strange antiquated feeling because they're not words that we use anymore. We don't care about polar explorers now like we did then. Yeah, and that's 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 so interesting. And one of the, I mean, I had I did have a question about the Norwegian. I mean, I I had quite a lot of French in my last novel, and uh, people would sort of comment on it and say, "Well, I just skipped over those bits." And I, I will confess, my Norwegian is a little rusty uh, <laughs> these days. Did 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 you did you get any comments from people about about it? I mean, I I agree with you. I think that it, what it did was to um, imbue the the text with a a slightly mystical alien uh, quality, but we, I mean, did 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 you? How much did you think about? What, is this too much? Uh, where, where where did you? Where how did you manage to get that? that yes, report? that is one of the ways that I thought about it, and I asked myself very often if it was too much or if it was um, if it if it was a bad idea altogether. You know, uh, for exactly that reason that you say. Incidentally, I loved all the French expressions. And, and descriptions in your in your story uh, and in the Paris hours and all the French names and all the French culture. I mean, that's a big part of what the book is about. I think in exactly the same way that the Norwegian part of northernmost is significant. And so that conversation was a long and hard one with myself first. Um, but I thought of it. I'm glad you described it as that sort of mystical feeling because I the way that I always thought of it while I was writing it was that it gave it a sort of strangeness, almost mm -hmm. like its own uh, po poetics or something like that, that were um, obviously in a foreign language, but that you didn't need, you didn't even need to know what the Norwegian words meant. You just needed to see them written in italics on the page to know that this is, and, and you could almost always, I think if you're reading carefully, figure out some sort of context about what about what they about what they mean and oftentimes there's even a, a clue given um but yeah I, I mean i thought about it very much and then you know, when i when i worked on um the editorial process with my then editor um we we had many conversations about it and about what should stay and what should go one of the i mean peculiarly one of the one of the things that we talked about was the the diacritics in Norwegian have changed from the 19th century to now the 21st century. And originally, and for most of the editorial process, we used the 19th century diacritics for the 19th century sections and the 20th century diacritics for the, or the 21st century diacritics for the 21st century part of the story. And eventually we decided that that was just a little busy and that people would forgive us for, 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 for just using the contemporary ones. But that's the sort of thing that you work out with an editor, especially if you have a, a, a good editor like I'm lucky enough to have had. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, that's fascinating. So one of the things that um, all of these books um, put me in mind of, and you may roll your eyes at this, but I, I hope you won't, is, uh, is actually is Salman Rushdie. Um, and I say that because when I read his novels, there's a very strong sense that absolutely nobody else could have written them. Um, if you like, he was born to tell these particular stories. And, and I, I can't articulate why exactly, but you are the other person who I think of in that way when I read these books and I think, yeah, that's Peter. <laughs> he was like, he was put here to write these stories. Um, cause, and you just, you fully inhabit these stories and these lives and the landscape in which, in which these, these extraordinary stories unfold. And so Rushdie has this, uh, the myths of the Indian subcontinent to draw upon as a resource for his stories. And you have the frozen North. Um, I mean, is that, does that sound right to you? Do you, do you feel that you sort of, you found your literary home, uh, in that, in that way, in the, in these, this, this landscape that you've, created? I guess it's question one. And then question two is, would you ever, which kind of, and obviously allied to the first one, would you ever consider writing about somewhere else? <laughs> um, 
so I'm a little a little stumped because the the flattery is overwhelming. I mean that, that yeah, I'm not going to apologize for flattery. <laughs> the 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 simple truth of the matter is, Alex, especially with respect to landscape, is that when I began writing Safe from the Sea, and you mentioned Greg Michelson, who who was my editor at Umbrella for Safe from the Sea and the Lighthouse, right, and remains still a very good friend of mine, and I know I know you and Greg are close as well. Um, I, I don't know if I would tell him this, hopefully he's not here tonight to, to hear this, but when I began that novel, Safe from the Sea, I had no idea what, the, what it was going to be about, who the characters were, nothing. I only knew that I wanted to write about this place in the, in the world. And it was a very conscious choice. I had written as a graduate student a couple of, um, a couple, well, one whole novel that was just terrible and another half of a novel that was also just terrible. And I couldn't figure out why they were so terrible, except that people kept telling me how terrible they were. And I thought, so what is it that's, what am, what am I flailing about with here? And one of the things that occurred to me is that I was trying to write stories in the mode of someone like F. Scott Fitzgerald or Hemingway, you know, these expatriate stories, even though I'd never been an expatriate, uh, set in places that, I remember one of them was set in a town on the Mediterranean, a Spanish town right on the border with France called Port Bou, that I had sat in, in a train for a couple of hours, didn't even get out of the train, and then imagine 300 pages of a story set there. And of, and of course I had no idea what I was doing or what I was writing about because I didn't know anything about the place. And that experience of feeling, um, oh, I don't even know what the, what, how to describe it, almost like a voyeur in my own novel. I was like, I have to fix that. I can't do that anymore. And so I thought I'm gonna write about this place that I love so well, that, that, is, that is so much a part of my life and that I do know with, a kind of intimacy that will hopefully then breathe into the characters. And eventually I figured out who was going to be in that story and, 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 and what the story was going to be about. But I thought, yeah, this is where I'm going to write about this, this place, this, the shore of Lake Superior in, in Minnesota. And so not everything in all the books takes place there. And in fact, like you know, we've alluded to, half of this book, Northernmost, takes place in a, in a totally different country. But it is a country, of course, that uh, you mentioned being, you, you could be set down in either place. The same is true. If you spun me around and put a blindfold on me and put me on an airplane, and if I couldn't see uh, islands, I wouldn't necessarily know if I was in Norway or, or, or on, the, on, the, on the Norwegian or on the shore of Lake Superior. So again, a very long answer. I think that um, I, I do feel, I mean, I'm a hundred percent committed to this place. And I can't imagine writing a book not set there. In fact, the book that I'm finishing now, um, which only about a third of it takes place there, for another book that I started writing in 2008, my first notebook is for this book. Um, and, and I think that the reason that I couldn't ever settle into it is because I didn't have that sensation of being anchored in this place that was so familiar in my fictive mind. The, the North Shore. So I just decided I would put part of the story there. And lo and behold, that is what's helped me s sort of see it through to its end. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about uh, the, this, this extraordinary endeavor that you've undertaken, these three books. And you alluded just a minute ago, I think, to this. So you kind of maybe answered my question, but I wonder if you could expand on it a little bit. When you began The Lighthouse Road, did, did you know that you were going to write three books and how much, I mean, it's, it just, it just, it, it astonishes me because I just don't have the discipline to, <laughs> it's hard enough for me to finish one book before getting bored. So the, you know, and I'm just, I'm just, it's you, every book is, is, is different yet the same. Right. Uh, there, there, there are themes and there, there's this wonderful language. Um, and I'm just curious when when you began, did how much how much did you have plotted out? I mean, you said that you had written some of Old Iron and stuff at the very beginning back in 2009. So did I, I just I just it blows my mind how you were able to conceive of this this arc that that spans three books. So I just wonder if you could talk about that a little bit and make me feel yeah. totally 
physically inferior. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous thing to feel inferior about. I mean, it is. Um, it was. Uh, uh, it was baffling to me when I sat down to write the Lighthouse Road that what I envisioned, and there's a story to this too, which is that Safe from the Sea, a book that ended up as a novel, only being about 250 pages long, when it was first finished, it was like. 700 manuscript pages, more than a ream of paper. Um, it took 10 years to write. And part of the reason that it took 10 years to write was because I had no idea what I was doing or what it was going to be about. So there was a long process of discovery with that. In that book, I was lucky enough to, you know, to have it published and so excited about that in this lifelong dream of becoming an author and, you know, being taken seriously, hopefully, was uh, addictive and um, and really important to me. And I continue to take my work as an author very seriously. I mean, I work very hard on it, as I know you do. And I think we share a similar sensibility about this. This is not, you know, we're not doing this just for, for the fun of it. I mean, we feel a, a, a duty to our stories. And I, and I definitely felt that way about what I wanted to be the second book, which was gonna, which was, the Lighthouse Road, but originally it was just going to be the immigrant's story. And what happened, Alex, is that as soon as, and I've told this story many, many times too, I hope I'm not repeating myself to you or to anybody in, in the audience, but as soon as that woman gets here, and at the end of the first chapter, she gives birth to a son, the, I, I mean, I knew that his story was going to be important. And as soon as I wrote his story, I all of a sudden could see the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And so what I thought was going to be a year long project of writing this one woman's life story suddenly was not that at all. Suddenly it was, you know, I had the whole family tree and the names changed a little bit over the years, but I knew who everyone was. And just with that family tree sitting in front of me, I could begin to imagine the different kinds of lives that these characters would lead. And so when I say, uh, you know, that, that, that some of these stories have been in my mind from the very outset, it's literally true. And, but I didn't, I didn't know what the, what each book was going to be. I only knew that I had two choices and I could either write one book that would encompass, you know, seven generations and would be a thousand pages long. And that sounded like a terrible idea for all sorts of reasons. Um, but also, I knew that if I broke this, the family's story up, that I could then tell different kinds of stories. And, you know, you alluded to this. They're, they're similar, of course. They have the same blood coursing through each of them. But they're quite different kinds of stories, at least as far as I'm concerned. I mean, The Lighthouse Road is historical and literary and uh, not very experimental. Wintering becomes... a quite an adventure story um, and is experimental in some ways in terms of the storytelling. And then Northernmost is a romance in a lot of ways. I mean, there's other things as well, but I knew that I could have the experience of writing different kinds of novels if I broke it up. That's so interesting. Well, I want to ask you about that and then we'll, we've got some questions here. So I'm, I'm going to hug you for a little bit longer. So we haven't talked much about Greta really, but, um, I just um, adored the uh, the love affair um, that she has with with Stig. Uh, we, you know, in this book, we are treated to one of the most intimate and most convincing depictions of two people falling in love that I can I can remember. Um, That's incredibly flattering. I'm very happy to hear that. Well, it, but I, I really mean it, and I wanted so I wanted to ask you about it because none of it really made any sense, which is what made it so believable uh, to me. Um, and anyone who's ever fallen in love will read these scenes with, with Greta and Stig and feel this sort of I I think a, a sort of deep recognition, the sort of the giddy insanity of it, the eroticism of it, the loss of control. It's 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 fabulous. Um, and just speaking personally, I've always been slightly terrified of <laughs> telling that kind of story because mm -hmm. falling in love is such a personal thing. But as writers, we have to find the universal. So something that everyone is going to be able to like, where's that chime of recognition? So really, I, so my question is like, did you have any similar reservations 
first of all. And then secondly, how the hell did you do it? It was yeah. just, it was, it was such a gutsy thing that you did. It wasn't at all obvious. It was, you, there was not a cliche in sight. And, and that because of that, it felt totally true. So first of all, Thank you. Uh, and secondly, please explain, because it was, and, and just ex talk about it if you would, because it was, it was just wonderful. I just adored it. That, that um, you know, I, I have, I think probably naturally felt so many reservations about, I, I mean, from the outset, I felt reservations about telling Greta's story, especially telling it in the way that I did, which in my mind is totally unreserved and unabashed. I just wanted it to be um, uh, hopefully very true and also exciting because I think that the excitement that attends the, the especially as an adult, those uh, those first blushes of falling in love is, I mean, it, it makes you young again. It makes you crazy again in a way that, um, that younger people don't necessarily understand. And that most people who are happy in their lives and happy in their marriages have forgotten <laughs> or, or, or don't recall what the frequency that is that you talk about, right? Like I know a lot, uh, most of my friends are happily married for 20 years or more now and they adore their wives and they love their wives. Um, but they, th there's the excitement that attends Greta and Stiggs coming together is not a part of their, how they talk about their life. And so I wanted, I wanted there to be, you know, you described as a kind of lunacy or kind of insanity in which I, I think it is. And I was terrified of it too. Uh, it, I mean, Good, truly. Like yeah, for, for all sorts of reasons, not least of which I was going, you know, while I was writing her, I was going through a divorce of my own. And, and it was, um, I mean, it was a, a scary prospect and it was a difficult time in my life for sure. Um, a couple of things though. One is I wanted the challenge of, and I never, I've never written anything even remotely sexy in my books. And I wanted there to be something sexy in this book. And Greta seemed like a terrific candidate to, to fulfill that, that role. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted her experience of rediscovering herself to include that. I wanted to give her that because a, a, a not insignificant part of her frustration in her life and in her marriage is that she's numb to her erotic pleasures and to and to and to and, and frankly to happiness generally and so i wanted i wanted that to be a part of her evolution and a part of her transformation having said all of that many many sleepless nights wondering if i'd gone too far in the descriptions wondering if i was making too much out of it and thinking an awful lot about whether i was doing an okay job at it because there's nothing more embarrassing right than than the bad sex award that comes out each year and i didn't yes. certainly yes. didn't want to be a candidate for that um but but the more i thought about it and the more i deliberated over it the more i came to believe and I, and and the more i talk about it now the more firm i am in this belief that it's just a part of who she is and the other thing that's true is that if i were telling if if stig were the point of view character and Stig this quite handsome and um, kind of almost exotic Norwegian man who is Greta's lover. Uh, if, if the story were from his point of view and, and, and told the story of his sexual reawakening, we wouldn't even be talking about it. The field is totally different if you're a man and if you're a woman. And I mean, you might say something about that there's some steamy parts in the book, some soggy parts in the book, as my kids call it, which I can't believe. Um, but but, but it, there's a there's a double standard that we have, and I and, and I was aware of that. I mean, I was aware of that, and wanted to you know give it a good middle finger that that of course women have sexual lives that are worth writing about and worth reading about. And of course, Greta would be one of those women. And so, um, so I wanted to include it. And I know that you're not just asking about sex. There's the whole, the, the, there's the rest of her love story with Stig, which, um, which hopefully is, is 
as you say, you know, it, it is convincing and free of cliches. I will say just one more thing about it. Uh, there, was a, there was a moment as I was sort of coming to terms with this where, and it's a scene that I wrote early, but was later on in the book when Greta is talking to her father about the fact that she's leaving her husband. Um, and, you know, she's not giving him all of the details, but she knows that she's, she's done with her husband. And she says something like, people talk all the time about the thrill of falling in love. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a conversation that everyone has. No one talks about what it's like to fall out of love. And when I said that, I was like, yep, that's true. Because it, it, even in my own life, no one wanted to talk to me about falling out of love. You know, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> that's not a fun conversation for anyone. So you're alone with that. You're alone with that as a human being. And uh, I didn't want Greta to be alone with it. Yeah, and so that's so interesting. Yeah, I just, I, I was just, I was, I loved it and I was so impressed by it. And just everyone, if you haven't ever done this, Peter mentioned the Bad Sex Awards. You should all go and Google that. It's a very, very funny thing they do. I forget who does it. Somebody in England does it every year. And they basically comb through all this very high-minded literature and find the most egregiously overwritten um, over metaphored um, <laughs> yeah. in, in, circumlocution in, uh, and, and it's hysterically funny. And the funny thing, the best bit about it is that the writers who win this award, who get nominated for it, all pretend um, that this is quite funny and they're up for the joke and so, oh yeah, well, I'm honored to be, you know, right? <laughs> That was, I worked so hard on that damn thing. Yeah. How can they be taking the piss out of it in this way? Exactly. Anyway, don't look for it. It's, it's the wonderful. Other, wonderful the other funny. thing that's true about it is that they're usually really terrific writers who yeah. are, who are, who, who are under consideration for, for these, these awards. It's hilarious uh, on all sorts of levels, not least of which they're usually, I mean, it's not uncommon for several people on the Booker long list or short list to be included in the Bad Sex Award. Oh, yeah, they're fab. I mean, they're, yeah, and that's a funny thing. They're fabulous writers, but I think it goes to a little bit what you were saying. There's some, yeah, there's a blind spot sometimes, and people think, "Oh Christ, I'm going to write something about sex." Right? Well, where's my purple prose? And then they just they move into this different thing. It's like, you know, you're a wonderful writer. Just do that thing that you do, which is kind of yeah. what you did, and then they, and, it, and it worked beautifully. All right. Let, let, um, let me say one more thing about that because it just occurred to me when you pulled out your purple pen there. One of the things that I realized very early, as soon as I was like in the middle of writing the first sex scene, is that of, there, are, there are only a few subjects that are like this, but sex doesn't require metaphor necessarily, oh. or, um, or, or precious language. Sex is just sex. And usually um, sex when it's written well is it's plain to see and understand there's, you know, oftentimes it can, it, you can quite, you know, keep it behind a veil and that can be lovely too, but you don't have to make um, sexual appetite or anything sexual into something that it's not. It can be just sex. And I think that in my experience reading books with, about sex, that it's most convincing when it stays in, it, it, you know, when, it, when it's going straight ahead and it's not trying to do literary somersaults to, to, to tell the story. And, and, and so that was a, a, a rule of thumb as I was yeah. writing those scenes. Oh, somersaults. I mean, that's a whole different sphere of sex. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I immediately think about um, A Sport in the Pastime by James yeah. Salter, which of course is sort of notorious. But, but again, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah. We'll go and read that as well. Uh, so we got a couple of questions. So Sarah Stonehenge. Hi, Sarah. Oh, dear. <laughs> Good to see you. Sarah, uh, Sarah, see, first of all, hi, Sarah. This, um, this beautiful um, ceramic polar bear up here was a gift from Sarah. Oh, it was? Oh, yeah. fantastic. It's beautiful. It's from an artist who lives up on the North Shore. And so thank you for that, Sarah. It's been up over my shoulder for all these events so far. Perfect. So she has a two-part question. Uh, you've mentioned that you've been writing prolifically during COVID. Are you sharing what's next for you now that the trilogy is done? 
uh, <laughs> and then it's your, also I see you've been cutting your own hair. Do you believe that was a good choice for you? <laughs> oh yeah, Sarah. Sarah, for those of you who, who don't know, and probably there are very few of you, Sarah is a, 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 another writer here in Minnesota, and I think a brilliant writer um, and, and, a, and a dear friend. So I take the, the COVID hair uh, comment in stride. And um, yeah, no, it's been uh, about, well, it's been eight months since I got a haircut, so it's a little unwieldy. Um, but maybe that's, you know, because I'm spending less time getting haircuts and more time at my desk. Uh, I guess I'm not spending uh, less time only not getting haircuts, but in doing everything else. And I just made a choice that I was going to work. I was going to, you know, as, as miserable as, as most of us are um, locked in our homes for most of the, the day, I, I wanted to have something to show for it at the end. And after a month or two of, of feeling sorry for myself in the world, I just decided that I'd redirect that energy. And I'm not really talking much about uh, the new book, except I've been working on it for a very long time. It's a book about brothers and it's different. It's, it's, it's quite a lot different. Um, it's urban, um, it's set in Minneapolis mostly. Um, and it's called the Ski Jumpers and it's about ski jumping as well, which is a sport that is a, as a kid. Um, and as a young man, I did pretty, pretty competitively for a pretty long time. Cool. Uh, Kerry um, writes, for the record, the beard is getting fan commentary. So I'm not quite sure what that means, but I will hunt that down for you, Peter, and let you know. My beard is getting? Apparently, yes. That's, that's, that's the word on the street. So, um... so there was, there was a, I know that no one cares about this except for me. There was a moment... Um, probably in April or May, when for several months, like since Christmas, I hadn't trimmed my beard and my beard was like, I mean, if I, if I fluffed it out, it was like, you know, as big again as my head on my, on my chin. <laughs> <laughs> and for a reason, I can't quite remember what it was, but I was looking at Henrik Ibsen online, a picture of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then I went to the to the to the mirror, not to gaze at myself, but to wash my hands or something. And it was I felt uh, like the spitting image of those old Henrik Ibsen That's photos, funny. where his beard is six inches wide on either side. <laughs> so I, I thought it was trimmed up tonight. Oh, you look very nice. Um, all right, so I, I've got a couple more questions, and then we'll we'll um, we will wrap this up. And you mentioned um, your editor. Um, Gary Fiskerton, right, who, who um, I know has been with you through the last two books, but he, I know that he left and, and um, at some point during this process, and that's something that I know as well. In fact, my editor, in my last two books, my editor left me in the, in the process both times. Same person managed to leave me twice, but that's another story. Anyway, um, but you, um, so I, I sort of sympathize, but you, you talked about when we were chatting a couple of weeks ago about the editing process and how you kind of, you feel like you're wandering around uh, and um, uh, looking, looking to find reason and sense. And, so, and it's the rewriting is where everything sort of coheres into a, into a meaningful um, uh, unit. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk, because that was very interesting to me um, to, to hear you say that. And I, certainly that's how, how I sort of look at it as well. You sort of, you know, you get to the end and you know that you're probably not even halfway through because there's so much more to do. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about that and about the wandering around and making sense of it. And then also talk about what happens when your editor leaves, because, you know, the relationship between an author and his or her editor is a weirdly intense one and um and it, and and uh, you know haven't gone through it. i it, it's very very discombobulating to be on this journey with somebody else and then suddenly you turn around and there's somebody else sitting next to you um so i just wonder if you could just briefly talk about that and and yeah. i, I to my own experience very quickly i mean i actually found that 
having some having a new set of eyes was actually wonderful for me and 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 it was helpful but i but it, i wasn't happy about it either right right so with respect to to gary we it was it was a, a a very strange and to use your word discombobulating experience we had uh and i can tell you the days that i learned all this because they happened uh you know right alongside uh, uh some other momentous days in my life last year um we had taken the book through its edits so i was done with his edits um which i'm very grateful for gary um on top of being a terrific friend of mine um, is, you know, I mean, he's uh, one of the great editors of, of, of the last 50 years. And I learned so much editing wintering and editing, editing northernmost with him. And on a Wednesday afternoon, we were, we had a meeting, Gary and I did, we had to talk about a couple of things. As I recall, we were going to shore up just a couple of small details with the manuscript, and we were going to talk about covers, which we were in the middle of of um, of deciding on and 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 thinking about. And so we had that meeting. We f followed up the next day, uh, which was a Thursday, you know, just to just to uh, you know to to sort of congratulate each other on making such a good choice about the cover, which was this this cover. Uh, and then the next day, I found out that he was that 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 day he was let go, uh, and so we were we had been working on it right up to the moment that he was he was dismissed from Kanaf. And I don't know the story about what happened. I've heard rumors, but I, you know Gary remains a good friend of mine, and I'm not interested in that. Um, and, and so we had taken the book to sort of like our work was kind of done, okay. except that except that at Kanop, that everything is so editorially driven. Mm -hmm. And Gary's, at least in, in the case of Gary, like he was, we, we remained in weekly contact for a year after Wintering came out just to talk about how it was going and what, you know, what, what I was working on and, and things that we could still be doing. And so he kept his hands right in there. And that's what I lost, I mean, as well as, him editing future books. Um, but that's what I lost. And then it went, you know, then uh, Sonny Mehta, who is the publisher, who also just passed away, at, at, um, yeah. not that Gary passed away, but Sonny passed away. So Sonny was on the case for a, a couple of months. And then it was eventually handed over to my vintage editor, um, Tim O'Connell, and I, and I loved him. And we did a little bit of tweaking with the manuscript afterwards, but very, very little. So um, but but that but there is an incredibly disorienting sensation that goes along with like the person who was going to usher this book out into the world and who had all the investment in it is now gone, and that was that's a huge that was a huge letdown and a huge disappointment for me. But I mean, but Knopf is a world class publisher, of course, and and, and um, you know I feel like everyone is still working very hard and I'm really grateful for all of it. I, I, you know, with respect to the wandering around in the story, I'll just try to be brief here. I feel like that's a really important part of the process for me. That is whether it lasts for 50 or a hundred pages and then I settle in and, and get down to it or whether it lasts for years in the case of the book that I'm working on now, for 10 years, the walk, the walking around in it and making a mess of it and trying to figure out is a huge part of it. It's also the most exciting part of it. It's the part where you make all the discoveries and it's, I liken it to falling in love. Like you, you meet someone, you meet the story that you want to tell and the characters that you want to describe and bring to life and spend time with. And that's all very exciting and then the intimacy of that relationship is borne out over the over the next year or two or three or four, or however long it takes to write the book. And that's the period of falling in love. So that by the time you get to the end, you are in love and couldn't be happier with, you know, with what you've done. And, and, and it's as mystical as that and as exciting as that, um, at least in my own experience. 
And that's why, you know, I, I felt when you talked about saying goodbye to these characters after 10 years and, you know, how much you love them. I mean, I, I, that struck such a chord with me. Um, and I just, to I know exactly what you mean. There's, I remember sitting in a cafe in Colombia talking about one of my books with, with a friend of mine and I, I started weeping. Um, and I just suddenly thought, well, my, I'm done now with these. I mean, they're, st they're out there, they're living and people are right. still reading the book, but I'm done. Uh, and I was very sad about it. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a very well, bittersweet, I, perhaps I should say, because uh, yeah, you're proud of it too. I think that the fact that you, that that is true of you and that you are, um, uh, uh, that you would tell that story about yourself. That's one of the reasons that I, love you and your work so much because it takes that kind of vulnerability i think not for every kind of writer but for writers like you know like you and i though we're different we're similar in a lot of ways as well uh the the that vulnerability and that uh attention and that affection all of that needs to be there our books don't work and um and I, I think that that's true anyway. I, I certainly feel like that's true for me, which is why the saying goodbye part is difficult because you're invested not just in time and in your resources and in your imagination, but your emotional life. My emotional life is so directly tied to these characters and I've learned so much from them. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and now I don't get to necessarily keep learning from them, so. Yeah. yeah. No, well said, that's, that's beautifully put. All right, well, on the subject of saying goodbye, it's, we're pretty much time to go, but I do want to ask you, because um, I always want recommendations from everybody, but particularly from writers who I love, what have you read lately um, that you just adored so we, so we can all go and run out and buy them? <laughs> you, you mentioned that you would ask me this, so I actually went way, uh, maybe not way above and beyond, but I, I put the three books right here that I was going to talk about. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, saw, <laughs> I saw you had Nathan's book. My son had yes. that. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead I, and tell I, uh, super embarrassed. The, the book is um, four years old, uh, The Nix is. And Nate is a good friend of mine. And for, for as long as that book has been out, I've been dying to read it. But because it's about that thick, <laughs> um, and because life is so overwhelmingly busy, I haven't had a chance, but I did read it recently. And I must say that I was bowled over. I catapulted to one of my all time favorite books. It is so funny. It is so intricately constructed. Um, there is so much tenderness and sadness in this book that you'll, when you're not laughing out loud, which is not something I do very often when I'm reading a book, you're, you're weeping inside because your sympathies and empathy for these characters is so, so ripe and so well attended by me. Um, and it's just really interesting politically. Um, it's largely about the, the riots during the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago but it was haunting how much it seemed like right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of his descriptions and so much of the politics that are at play in that book, it was just magnificent. And then next to that, the book in the middle here, um, a, a book called In the, um, In the Night of Memory by a Minnesota writer named Linda Lagarde Grover. And she's, um, she's uh, I, I, I hardly know how to describe the book. It's um, brilliant in its architecture. It's a story of um, a couple of young Anishinaabe girls who are, uh, their mother is forced to uh, give up to foster care um, because she's a, a troubled woman herself. And it's just this sort of reverberative and, and story and tribal story about what the girls go through and the way that the memory of their mother haunts them uh, and and how they make a life of their own despite not having her and thanks to the community that they're a part of. Uh, and it's just magnificent. It's so beautiful and so uh, just, just magnificent. And, and a lot of folks haven't heard of her outside of Minnesota, but uh, to my way of thinking, she's on a par with Louise Erdrich um, and not just because she's another Native American writer. And then the last book, uh, a book called The Great Offshore Grounds, 
uh, by Vanessa Veselka, which just came out this week, if I'm not mistaken, a couple of days ago, but that I read uh, six months ago or something uh, because uh, I, I, I gave the book a blurb. And it is, I said about the book in the blurb that uh, Vanessa writes with the power of the ocean tides. And I felt that way. Like, I felt every day that I sat down to read it just moved along in a way that was almost physical and almost outside of my power to control. And it's a story that again is political and, uh, and, and, and intimate and is basically a, a, a sort of road story about two girls going to going on a family quest, but it is so incredibly smart and the writing is so alive. I don't know how to just say it better than that. Um, but those are three books that I've recently read. Um, one that's brand new, one that's about a year old, and one that's four years old. All of them phenomenal. Wonderful. Well, on that note, thank you, my friend. I really loved speaking with you. Um, I think people have probably got the idea that I'm kind of quite keen on the book too. Um, so uh, just a final, just to remind you all, we've got loads and loads of copies uh, at Skylark. Please do drop us a line. We would love to sell you one, love to give you one of Peter's haiku. You, you can actually, um, we actually posted a picture of the haiku on our Instagram account and on Facebook. So you can even see what Peter wrote. It's quite lovely. Um, so um, yeah, please do that. We would really appreciate it if you would. Uh, next week, it's Natalie Jenner uh, next Thursday. Uh, hope to see you then. Peter, it's great to see you. Thank you again. Thanks everybody for watching and uh, see you soon. Take care. Thank you.